So this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry goes to Thomas Lindahl, Paul Modrich, and Aziz Sanjar jointly for their mechanistic studies of DNA repair. And now I welcome Thomas Lindahl up to the stage. Thomas Lindahl was born here in Stockholm, in this very city. He got his PhD in Stockholm and his very first discoveries in this field, realizing that it's actually not stable as a rock, but there is spontaneous decay and there must exist mechanisms to repair, and even going out to find these uh, molecular repair systems. He's now present in the United Kingdom, uh, working at Francis Crick Institute and Claire Hall Laboratories. And I'm very much looking forward to your lectures. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. All macromolecules are to some extent unstable. My own work has focused on the inherent liability of DNA itself. In my early studies uh, as a postdoc at Princeton University in the 1960s, we investigated heat-induced shape changes and unfolding of the macromolecular structure of purified transfer RNA, the small RNA molecules that are key components in protein synthesis. In these time-consuming experiments, I was surprised to observe that my purified tRNA was not only unfolded at elevated temperatures, which was known, but also very slowly decomposed in an irreversible way. I was advised by colleagues that human fingers often have substantial amounts of ribonuclease on their surface, that is the enzyme that degrades RNA, and that the problem might disappear if I improved my laboratory technique. Uh, but that was not the problem. Eh? I observed that different preparations of tRNA obtained by different methods uh, still remained Uh, with their slow decomposition in the same way. I extended this work to show that uh, decomposition of tRNA involved destruction of individual base residues and also involved slow cleavage of the phosphodiester bonds that link the RNA nucleotide building blocks together. I even published a short report on the heat-induced decomposition of tRNA that uh, nobody found particularly interesting. Uh, so I moved on to another laboratory uh, for experimental work on ligation and processing of strand breaks in DNA by previously unknown mammalian enzymes, such as DNA ligases and DNA exonucleases. Uh, but I had not forgotten the puzzling spontaneous decomposition of tRNA. When I moved back to Sweden and obtained my own research laboratory in Stockholm a couple of years later, I wanted to investigate if DNA, like tRNA, was susceptible to spontaneous slow decomposition. Huh? First slide, please. Shows a model of DNA. And it looks rather stable, so it was a far-fetched idea uh, that DNA, which is the carrier of the genetic information in our cells, might be unstable in the intracellular environment. In order to support such non-conventional work, I did not apply for a research grant, which may well not have been funded, uh, but used some Swedish funds I had already been awarded to study enzymatic pro processing of DNA strand breaks in mammalian cells. 
The initial strategy was to perform some pilot experiments on DNA instability, and if the results did not seem promising, quietly bury the project. But it turned out that although DNA was considerably more stable than RNA, it still underwent very slow but relevant decomposition in neutral aqueous solution. Together with my meticulous laboratory assistant, Barbara Nieberg, I then devised a series of time-consuming experiments to attempt to quantitate and characterize the very slow degradation of DNA solutions under physiological conditions. This meant investigating the stability of DNA at different pH values, uh, not too dramatically removed from neutral pH, at various elevated temperatures, and at different ionic strengths and levels of charge neutralization. In order to facilitate our analysis, most studies were performed with DNA radioactively labeled in individual base residues. Uh, such DNA can be prepared from various bacterial mutant strains with defects in synthesis of precursors of DNA, grown in the presence of uh, commercially obtained radioactive base residues. Aliquots of such DNA solutions were incubated for several days and then analyzed by chromatography. The most conspicuous change was that small numbers of base residues were lost from the DNA. In particular, the purine bases adenine and guanine. Next slide, please. So this is guanine, and it can be lost if this base sugar bond is cleaved here. Here is a summary of here. Oh, no, ne next, the previous slide, please. This one, yeah. This is a summary of the different changes that were detected. Uh, this is a section of uh, uh, DNA, one of the two strands of DNA with the backbone of uh, sugar phosphate residues and the individual bases, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and adenine. And the little arrows I put in here indicate the sites that are particularly susceptible to damage. Huh? The basic sites that result from the loss of guanine and adenine are chemically identical. Eh? And they were introduced at similar rates. Eh? So to know the identity of a missing base, you have to consult the information in the opposite strand of the DNA. Next slide, please. Among the various lesions, besides losses of bases, there is also damage to individual uh, base residues. And the most important one of those is deamination of the base cytosine, loss of this amino group here. This occurs spontaneously in aqueous solution. Next slide, please. And uh, this shows the consequences of this event the amination of cytosine leads to a change in genetic, specific, genetic specificity, coding specificity. So the resulting uracil will then base pair with the base adenine instead of guanine, which is the mate of cytosine. Huh? So you have a mutation here. Uh, when I quantitated all these losses of cha or changes of information in DNA, the numbers were surprisingly high. Next slide, please. In a mammalian cell, there are 10 to 20,000 changes per cell and per day. And the most frequent 
loss of than is loss of purine bases from DNA. But there are also other changes that occur at quite a significant rate uh, under physiological conditions. These numbers are for the double-stranded DNA. Uh, there is some protection of bases by the double helical DNA structure. While double-stranded and single-stranded DNA are depurinated at similar rates, uh, uh, single-stranded DNA is uh, 150 times more susceptible than double-stranded DNA to deamination of cytosine and 5-methylcytosine. This means that in a transcriptionally active replicating cell, where DNA opens up a little bit, uh, uh, there are about 300 potentially mutagenic cytosine and 5-methylcytosine deamination events per day. This decay of the cellular DNA would lead to an unacceptable deleterious loss and alteration of genetic information. The answer to this dilemma must be that there is a correction mechanism. In the search for such mechanisms, uh, next slide, please. We established that a basic sites can be removed and replaced by an excision mechanism. So here is an, a basic site, a missing base, and a special nuclease, an AP endonuclease, cleaves the DNA at the site, and then an enzyme removes the sugar phosphate residue, which no longer has any genetic information, and a small gap is generated in DNA, which is filled in by a DNA polymerase, and finally mended by DNA ligase. In mammalian cells, uh, uh, these two functions are contained the removal of the sugar phosphate and the filling in of a gap are catalyzed by the same small enzyme, DNA polymerase beta, which has two different demands uh, for these two catalytic events. The same general excision and repair strategy is used for, uh, for other types of DNA lesions such as uh, DNA damage induced by ultraviolet light, as you will hear from Dr. Sanyar, or to correct replication errors in the DNA, as you will know from Dr. Modric. Next slide, please. If the DNA contains an altered base, uh, which is shown on the left slide here, this is a cytosine that has become a uracil and now is uh, contained in this mismatch here, G opposite U. Uh, I found that a previously unknown DNA repair enzyme acts on this substrate. We call it a DNA glycosylase because it cleaves a base sugar bond in DNA. In contrast, uh, nucleases uh, cleave phosphodiester bonds. We reconstituted this base excision repair pathway, repair pathway with purified enzymes, both from bacteria and from human cells. And this is the actual pathway, which I've talked about. The enzymes uh, actually act consecutively on the altered lesion. And uh, what you can see here is the experimental evidence uh, here. A stretch of synthetic double-stranded DNA has been made that contains a uracil residue in the center of one of the two DNA strands, which is shown here. And then it's mixed with a complementary DNA strand, 
and uh, it can still be visualized as such uh, by gel electrophoresis under conditions where the DNA strands have been separated. If there's uracil in DNA, the DNA strand remains intact after removal of this base. Huh? We have treated it here with an enzyme that removes the uracil DNA, but the DNA chain still hangs together. But an a basic site has been generated, which is susceptible to cleavage by the next enzyme in the pathway, the endonuclease for a basic site. So, uh, the sugar phosphate residue at the site of damage is then removed, uh, and the DNA polymerase fills in the gap, and finally, a DNA ligase seals the DNA. Models for various aspects of this pathway have been proposed by several groups. Uh, next slide, please. Including us. It is not a simple task uh, for the DNA glycosylase to find a single uracil base in a large excess of DNA. So this repair enzyme acts by scanning the DNA, traveling along the DNA, and when it finds the, an alteration, it flips out the altered base, huh? 180 degrees. Uh, so the repair enzyme uh, can then initiate the repair process. So far, I have discussed how repair enzymes can restore damage to DNA. But, uh, can restore damage to DNA. But occasionally an organism can also use induced changes in the DNA structure to generate helpful genetic diversity. A striking case of this is the efficient diversification of antibodies. Next slide, please. This is an antibody with two chains, a heavy and a light chain. And the active site of the antibodies is a variable region eh, where the specificity of the antibody is contained. In order to improve the repertoire of various antibodies, an antibody producing cell can have the ability to actively change the structure of genes encoding antibodies by targeted deamination of cytosine in DNA. Uh, this idea and the further processing were due to the brilliant insight of the late Michael Neuberger in Cambridge, UK. I had the pleasure to collab collaborate with the Neuberger group. Uh, one specific deaminase, AID, uh, discovered by Honjo, caused targeted deamination of antibody genes. And the uracil DNA glycosylase then processes this lesion and triggers local mutagenic changes, which are reflected in an expanded and more efficient antibody repertoire. Next slide, please. So far, I've talked about hydrolytic damage caused by water in DNA. But there are other types of DNA damage caused by the oxygen we breathe and metabolize, for example. One particular sinister form of such oxidative DNA damage is the oxidation of guanine in DNA to 8-oxo-G, 8-oxo-guanine. Huh? or 8-hydroxyguanine in different atomeric forms, which is shown here. And this oxygen is here, where there wasn't oxygen before, which is here. This generates a miscoding base, and this lesion is excised by a specific DNA glycosylase, which is different from the enzyme that removes uracil from DNA. Next slide, please. This shows uh, this process in more detail. Uh, oxidation of uh, G can 
most usually uh, results in removal of this oxidized G by a DNA glycosylase and then a local repair process, space excision repair with uh, polymerase and a ligase. Uh, if the repair occurs during actual replication of DNA, so the two processes collide, the process is a bit more complex and more mutagenic. And this is what's taken advantage of to generate antibody diversity. Uh, next slide, please. There are other endogenous agents in cells than water and oxygen that can cause DNA damage. We showed that one important example is the reactive coenzyme S-adenosylmethionine, SAM, huh? which is shown here, and it easily donates its methyl group. Uh, SAM as such is so reactive that even in the absence of an enzyme, it has a tendency to donate its methyl group. And then it becomes formally a methylating agent or an alkylating agent, uh, which will methylate uh, other sites uh, in DNA or on other molecules. There are several susceptible sites for such alkylation on the DNA, shown by the various arrows here. And, uh, for example, I've talked about oxidation of or uh, guanine, and you can see that here, the sites on guanine for alkylation, the sites are different. So the sites of damage here are different from the sites that are damaged by water or by oxygen. Huh? So we get new problems, new lesions in DNA. With regard to alkylating agents, uh, there are three main approaches to deal with this damage. Uh, a base in DNA can be methylated in such a way that uh, it blocks replication of the DNA. Next slide, please. This is shown on the right-hand side, sorry, left-hand side. Uh, the an A residue in DNA has been methylated to become three methyl adenine, which is shown here. And there is a special DNA repair enzyme for this called AIG, alkyl uh, 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 guanine. And this residue blocks DNA replication, so it's a lethal lesion. Uh, this deleterious mutation event, uh, methylation event here uh, occurs in the minor groove of the DNA double helix, uh, which is usually completely free of methyl groups. Uh. Other methyl groups in DNA, like those in thymine, for example, are all in the major groove of the DNA. But here we now have a methyl group protruding into the minor groove of the DNA double helix, and uh, this is a potentially lethal lesion, huh? uh, because it prevents the DNA polymerases and RNA polymerases to travel in the minor group of the DNA. A special repair enzyme excises this methylated base uh, and triggers again a base excision repair event. This is analogous to the removal of uracil or uh, oxidized guanine from DNA. But in another approach, uh, a very mutagenic base, O6-methylguanine, which is shown here, is directly demethylated by a methyl transferase uh, that removes this methyl group. So this is an example of direct damage reversal. We don't excite any nucleotides from DNA here just the faulty uh, part of the residue. So this offending methyl group is transferred to the repair enzyme itself uh, to generate a methyl cysteine residue. Yeah. 
We use the term suicide inactivation for this event because the whole repair protein is destroyed by this methylation event. It cannot be regenerated. So it is a costly but effective form of DNA repair. And the reason it can't be regenerated by cleavage respond here is that methyl cysteine is an extremely stable chemical compound. You can boil it in hydrochloric acid without uh, any alteration. So it will be very difficult to repair this lesion just by removing the methyl group. It's actually easier to break down the whole methylated repair protein and make a new protein instead. More recently, we found another DNA repair enzyme that can remove methyl groups uh, from the toxic residues, one methyl adenine and three methyl cytosine in DNA. Next slide, please. It's shown on this side and in more detail here. One methyl adenine and three methyl cytosine. Huh? And the methyl groups here are in related or similar places of the DNA and they are lethal lesions. It took us many years to find this enzyme, although we sensed that there must be some form of repair of this damage, because this enzyme has very unusual cofactors. That is iron and the small metabolite alpha-ketoglutarate. They are both required for this. Uh, repair reaction. We proposed, uh, and it turned out, that this unexpected demethylation reaction with DNA using these odd cofactors also is mimicked in demethylation of histones, uh, which is important for uh, gene regulation in cells. So, in conclusion, next slide, please. There are several common molecules in cells that can damage DNA and which are impossible to avoid. I've talked about water, sodium uh, ox reactive oxygen. Uh, and wat water is, of course, a very weak reagent, but it is present at a very high concentration. Huh? And there are several other commonly occurring small molecules in cells that may also damage DNA. I believe that not all of those have even been found or identified as yet as DNA damaging agents, which suggests that there are more DNA repair enzymes waiting to be discovered. But the fact that water is a damaging agent for tissue components has been known for 400 years because William Shakespeare pointed this out. Next slide, please. Here's the graveyard scene in Hamlet, in which Hamlet shows himself to be an excellent scientist uh, by asking a series of logical and penetrating questions. So, Hamlet asks, how long will a man lie in the earth before he rots? And the grave digger answers him, in faith, he will last you some eight years. Or nine years, a tanner will last you nine years. A tanner is a leather worker, somebody who cures leather for making shoes. So, why he more than other than another? Why, sir, his hide is so tanned with his trade that he will keep out water a great while, and your water is a sore decayer of your wretched dead body. And then it continues, Hamlet picks up a skull, and, uh, and that leads to his great monologue on life and death. You might know that already. But perhaps you forgot that uh, 
Shakespeare, pin, Shakespeare pinpointed the deleterious effect of water on the soft components of the human body, including the DNA. Thank you. <laughs>